Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to get to know new people that I don't know yet and to um, see some of you that I already know. That's really nice. And I'm looking forward to the question session afterwards. Of course, you can also interrupt me anytime and, and ask questions in between. I try to look at the chat as well. So the first thing I would like to point out about my talk is that it's based on a joint paper with uh, Juan Pablo Aguilera, who is at uh, Ghent and uh, Vienna, and with uh, Michael Ratjen, uh, my PhD supervisor from Leeds, uh, and also with uh, Andreas Weiermann, who is also at Ghent. The next thing I would like to do is um, say a bit about the title, because this will hopefully give you a first idea of where I'm going. So Ackermann refers to the Ackermann function, and Goodstein refers to the Goodstein theorem, which Paris and Harrington have shown to be independent of piano arithmetic. I will recall this in a bit more detail. But the point that I want to make now is that um, Ackermann function and Goodstein principle um, are something that we associate very much with uh, natural numbers, so with a domain where the objects are finite. Um, the, they do not say something, at least not directly, about the existence of infinite sets. So it's really associated with first-order arithmetic, um, with finite objects, um, with finite combinatorics. Um, so um, yeah, this, this um, sort of domain. Um, and on the other hand, we have infinite sets, um, which play um, a very important role, for example, in computability theory and reverse mathematics. So in computability theory, um, you might ask whether um, desire whether um, elementhood in a certain set is decidable, and that's only interesting if, if the set you're looking at is infinite, or you might look at computation with respect to an oracle, and that oracle will be an infinite object. Of course, you also have infinite sets in set theory, um, but these are a bit further away from um, what I will say today. So today, infinite sets um, will be more infinite sets as studied in computability theory and reverse mathematics. And what I want to do is I want to establish um, a new connection between these two worlds. So between the world of first order arithmetic, of finite objects, of finite combinatorics, and between the world of second order arithmetic, of computability with respect to infinite oracles, of reverse mathematics. Um, and I think um, where Goodstein's theorem, for example, has been, has been studied a lot, um, but it's it's firmly rooted in in this tradition of finite combinatorics, and um, if if we can, um, as I will, establish sort of a, a larger context, a larger spectrum of ideas of related theorems that range from the very concrete and finite to the infinite, um, then um, yeah, that will give us a very uniform um, picture, which I find interesting, and I hope that you will find it interesting as well. Good. So to start, let me recall what um, this Goodstein theorem is. Um, a Goodstein sequence is an infinite sequence of natural numbers. And this sequence has a starting value, which is m. And then I also want to define it with respect to a non-decreasing function b from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. So that may be a bit different from what you have seen before in classical theorems. Um, but I will explain what role this B um, plays. So uh, these are my Goodstein sequences. The notation is a bit complicated, but we will need it later. It's an infinite sequence of natural numbers, and the parameters, well, G is just for Goodstein, and the, par the parameters at the moment are M for the starting value, and B for this function, uh, which you should think of as a base change. So how is this infinite sequence defined? Well, the first entry, so um, the entry at zero, is this starting value m. And now to get from the i-th entry to the next entry, the i plus first, what you do is um, you take the i-th entry and you write it in hereditary base bi notation. So you have this number, this i-th entry, and this function b tells you which base you should use for the i-th entry, and then you write that number in base bi notation. Uh, maybe it's good to look in, at an example. So if the i-th entry is uh, 2196 and um, the base at i is um, defined to be 3, then you would write 2196 um, like this. So, um, well, it's exponential base 3 notation. 
And um, when I say it's hereditary, that means that the exponent here, for example, is again written in base three notation. And then the exponent of that uh, is also written in base three notation. And then these twos here, um, they are coefficients um, because in base three exponential notation, you have uh, numbers smaller than three as coefficients. So you have two here um, and you have a one here, which I omit because well, it's times one. Good. And then once you have your hereditary base BI notation, what you do is you increase the base to the next base given by B, so to the base at I plus one. And then from the number that you get, you subtract one. So for example, um, here, every, five, uh, every three is replaced by a five and the coefficient two um, is um, kept. So that, that will become uh, important later, but for the moment we just keep the coefficients as they are, as in the usual uh, Goodstein theorem. Um, so all threes are replaced by five, and then we subtract one, and then we get a much larger number, which is 48 million, something uh, much larger than 2000 um, that we started with. So the intuition is um, that these Goodstein sequences, they grow extremely fast at the beginning. And what Goodstein's theorem tells you is that eventually they must reach zero. Okay. Um, now this base change function B, um, it's not included in many presentations of Goodstein's theorem, because in the famous result by Paris and Harrington, um, the base is always increased by one. So you start with base B0 equals two, and then you always increase it by one. So BI will always be uh, I plus two in the famous theorem by Paris and Harrington, which you will have on the next slide. But Goodstein himself, in fact, studied these sequences for general B. And what he showed in modern terminology is that um, the following um, statements are equivalent over a certain weak base theory commonly used in reverse mathematics. The first of these two statements that are equivalent is um, what is now known as Goodstein's theorem. And it says that for any such non-decreasing base change function and any start value m, the Goodstein sequence relative to these parameters will eventually reach zero. So there is an i such that the nth entry in this infinite Goodstein sequence is zero. And then um, the statement to which this is equivalent is that a certain ordinal number epsilon naught is well-founded. So epsilon naught uh, is defined as the least fixed point of ordinal exponentiation in the sense of ordinal arithmetic. And um, well, in fact, in this theory RCA zero, uh, you cannot speak about ordinals directly. You have to represent them, for example, by terms. And for um, epsilon zero, you can use the notion of counter normal form to represent your terms. Um, namely, um, epsilon zero is generated by um, the, the clause that if you already have um, ordinals alpha zero to say alpha n minus one, then you can form the ordinal alpha zero plus dot 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 plus omega alpha n minus one under the condition that alpha zero is um, bigger than the following ones so that the exponents are weakly decreasing. And then since epsilon zero is the first fixed point, um, Every, everything below it is sort of generated by this, by this process. And you can write down simply a system of terms which represents all these ordinals. And you can um, define the uh, order between the ordinals on these terms. And then you have a representation of this ordinal that you can use in the context um, in which you want to prove the equivalence. But um, that's not the, the main point here, how exactly you represent these ordinals. Good. So um, let me say, a bit more about the role of this B. Um, well, well-foundedness is a pi one one statement, so it uh, involves universal quantification over infinite sets. For example, you could formulate it as for any uh, non-empty subset of your ordered set, there is a minimal element in that subset. So it has this quantifier over infinite sets. And if you want an equivalence with the pi one one statement, um, you would expect that the um, other statement that's equivalent to it also contains quantification over an infinite set. And in this case, this infinite set is this non-decreasing um, function B. 
And uh, so Goodstein proved in his terminology um, that these two statements are equivalent over a weak base theory. And apparently, um, so you can look that up in a um, historical paper by Michael Ratjen. Apparently, in the submitted version of his paper, he also included an independence result because epsilon zero is known to be the so called proof theoretic ordinal of piano arithmetic. Um, and that was shown by Gensen before Goodstein's work. So you would expect that if you have a result like this, then um, somehow this statement here should be independent of piano arithmetic. And that's what Goodstein stated in the first version um, of his paper. Um, but then um, Paul Bernays, I believe, who was the referee, um, pointed out that uh, since you have this universal quantification over an infinite object, um, this version of Goodstein's theorem isn't really a statement of piano arithmetic proper. It's not in the language of piano arithmetic. And if it's not in the language, then you cannot say that, it's in, that it is independent. Um, of course, you're very close because um, to have a, a universal quantifier, it would be enough to, to just allow set parameters. You don't even need to introduce arbitrary um, second order quantifiers. Um, but, um, well, if you are precise, then it's not um, an independence result from piano arithmetic as usually understood. And for that reason, Goodstein apparently omitted this independence result from um, the published version of his paper. Now, the famous um, result of um, Kirby and Paris, I think I said Paris Harrington before, but that was a different independence result. So this one is by Kirby and Paris, sorry, um, is that um, if you fix one specific function for this base change, namely um, the, you start with base two and then you increase the base by one in each step. So you have base two plus i in the i-th step. Um, then Goodstein's theorem stays strong. And that's of course um, um, a, a really much stronger result. So it's a great achievement um, because it's, it's not clear at all um, that if you have a statement about arbitrary base functions and then you fix a relatively simple base that uh, the statement remains strong. But Kirby and Paris showed that uh, this is the case. Um, Goodstein's theorem for this specific function, which can then be expressed in first order arithmetic, stays strong, um, namely this unprovable in piano arithmetic. Good. And now, um, yeah, let me show you some questions that I would like to ask. So the first one um, may, may sound a bit ad hoc and unrelated to the rest, but we will see that actually it is not. So um, I think it's quite, quite an obvious question, actually. What happens um, if we do not increase just the base in these Goodstein processes, but also the coefficients? So for example, previously we had this uh, base three representation here. And then we changed the three into five, uh, but we kept the two. And now we could have the idea to change the coefficients as well. So why not increase two to three so that we have uh, at the place of this two here, uh, this three here, and here also two is changed into three and then still subtract one. And um, that leads us to 150 billion um, before we had 480 million. So it seems that uh, this can uh, increase still faster than before. And it's an obvious question to ask whether it will still reach zero at some point. Now, the second question that I have is, um, so if you look at the previous slide again, um, this version by Kirby and Paris of Goodstein's theorem is firmly rooted in first order arithmetic. It doesn't quantify over infinite sets because this B is fixed. In contrast, Goodstein's original version, as I said, contains this universal quantifier for any over infinite sets, um, but it doesn't contain any existential quantifiers over infinite sets. So still, um, it doesn't, well, it, it doesn't assert the existence of infinite sets as many, many statements that are studied in reverse mathematics, for example, do, and it's, it's not really part of the realm of, of infinite sets, I would say. So um, well, the achievement of Paris, Paris and Harrington was to sort of push this statement, which has something to do with infinite sets into the realm of first order arithmetic, and what I want to do is push it the other way. Um, so see whether we can turn this Goodstein theorem into a theorem that really belongs to the realm of computability theory of reverse mathematics of countable infinite sets um, by including an existential quantification over infinite sets as well. So that's my, my second question. Can we turn Goodstein theorem, theorem into something that asserts the existence of infinite sets? I have a question, uh, if you if you allow me, um, Anton. Yeah. 
uh, when, when you are in, in the first uh, question you have on this uh, on this slide here, you are increasing the two to three, but really there there are also some coefficients which are one, and that could also be increased. I guess I mean you are you are leaving them as they are basically, but uh, but you could increase also that say to two maybe or, or something like that. That's Absolutely correct. yes yes. I will have a, a general definition of these uh, coefficient changes on the next slide. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, let's maybe wait until then, but absolutely, that's, um, that's totally correct. Okay, and then, so let me just mention the, the third question. And this is, um, well, we have looked at um, a hereditary exponential notation, but of course I could consider different normal form notations of natural numbers. Um, and we will see one, um, so to anticipate this already based on the Ackermann function. And then you could ask, well, what happens if we represent natural numbers differently? And maybe we'll get stronger versions of Gustin's theorem. Okay, so um, then let's come to this question about how exactly these coefficient changes are implemented. So we still have this function b, which tells you what the base in the ith step is. And uh, one decision that I want to take is that coefficients um, are smaller than the base. So that's the case in hereditary exponential notation, and I want to sort of fix that as a general assumption. And if that's the case, um, then in the ith step as coefficients, you have everything from zero to um, the last number below the base, so bi minus one. And in the next step, you have everything to zero um, up to the number below the next base. So um, these coefficients, um, they can be increased um, according to any function ci at the ith step from these coefficients below base pi to the coefficients below um, the next base. And I also want to make the decision that this is an order embedding. Um, maybe I should have written um, it's strictly increasing. So by embedding, I mean that ci is strictly increasing. So um, uh, just as you said, I'm increasing two to three. I could also increase um, zero to one, for example, and, and one to two, um, absolutely. Okay, so let's look at an example for this. Um, I want to look at non-hereditary base two notation now. So the normal forms that I want to consider in this example and, and actually also over the next few slides, are non-hereditary usual binary notation. And in such a binary notation of a number, um, I want to view these um, exponents n0 to n k minus one as the coefficients. And uh, the base in this case is um, a bound on the coefficients. So it's a bit strange to call this base here because, well, intuitively two is the base, right? But it's just uh, some general terminology that, that I want to keep. So I consider usual binary representation of numbers, not hereditary, and um, I, I call the exponents coefficients. They must be um, in strictly decreasing order. And the base is, is a bound um, on the coefficients, which means that the numbers that have a base B representation are precisely those below two to the B. Okay, and then I want to define Goodstein sequences relative to this um, binary notation. I put two here in the exponent because um, um, two stands for binary notation and we will um, want to be more flexible later. So I want to fix this two here. And then the parameters are still a start value M, which is the first element of your Goodstein sequence. And then you still have one of these base change functions B. And then this C here is the family of these um, functions that um, determine the coefficient changes at the ith step. And um, this start value has to be below two to the B of zero in this case, because as, as I said, only the numbers below two to the B have a base B representation. So the start value um, needs to be written in, in that base. And for that reason, we, we need to have this inequality here. And then um, what we do is in the, uh, in, the, in the steps, we write the ith element of our Goodstein sequence in normal binary notation. And then we use this function C to increase the coefficients. So N0 is increased to CI of N0 and K minus one is increased to CI of N K minus one. 
And since I have assumed that these CI are embeddings, uh, or in other words, strictly increasing, this uh, normal form condition will be preserved. This here is still a normal form. And then I subtract one, and this gives me the next element of the um, Christian sequence. Are, are there any questions here? Okay, and now it turns out that, uh, in fact, um, this Goodstein process does, does not need to terminate. Namely, what you can do is you simply take um, um, the base 2 plus i in the i step, as in the sort of uh, uh, less complex, in the sense of quantifier complexity, um, statement of, of Kirby and Paris, and then you you put ci of n um, equal to n plus 1, which just means that you always increase all the coefficients by 1. And you start with m equals 3. So m equals 3 is 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 0. Um, so um, the 0th entry will be 2 to the 0 plus 1 plus 2 to the 0. And I claim that in general, the i-th entry is 2 to the i plus 1 plus 2 to the 0. Um, namely, well, if that holds for the i-th entry, then in order to get the i plus first entry, what you do is you increase both of the um, coefficients. So i plus 1 is increased to i plus 2, and 0 is increased to 1, and then you subtract 1, and then 2 to the 1 minus 1 is 2 to the 0. So then you have this form here again, but with um, i plus 2 at the place of i plus 1. And this does never reach 0 because, um, well, these numbers grow and grow. So this does not reach zero. Um, okay, so let's try to understand why this happens and whether we can find any reasonable criteria how to, um, how to avoid it. I think it's, it's good to look at these diagrams here. So let's maybe first look at the one on the right. Um, so here we have the, um, the um, base, uh, the coefficient changes as on the previous slide. So ci of n is n plus one, which means that every coefficient is always increased by one. And we can um, sort of uh, depict this as the following diagram. So the columns of these diagrams are always the coefficients that are available in the i-th step. In other words, um, the numbers below the i-th base. So the, i the first base at, at zero was two, so the coefficients that are available is are zero and one, and then the next base will be three and four, so the coefficients that are available will be zero, one, two, and zero, one, two, three. And now um, this um, equation here means that the coefficients are always increased by one, so this is um, depicted by the diagonal arrows, for example here from the zeroth element of the Goodstein sequence to the first um, coefficient one is increased to two, and then in the next step, that one is increased to three, and so on. And now the idea is that um, along this diagram here, in this diagram here, you glue along these arrows. And what that gives you is precisely the negative integers. Um, so if you sort of extend these arrows here, then in the direct limit, in a categorical sense, um, you will um, get uh, this point here. And um, well, since zero is below one here, this point here in the limit will be below that one. And the zeros um, in consecutive columns, they correspond to smaller and smaller elements in the limit. So you get the negative integers. And the point that I want to make is that this direct limit is ill-founded. Um, it may not be immediately clear why this is relevant, but we will see that it is. In contrast, in the usual Goodstein theorem, um, we have never changed coefficients, so this means that we always had um, ci of n equals n, and not changing coefficients corresponds to these um, horizontal arrows, and if you take the direct limit here, or in other words, glue along these arrows, then you will get the usual structure of natural numbers as the limit, uh, which is well found. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, any linear order can be obtained as the direct limit, or in other words, by gluing such a diagram, uh, and any countable linear order, I should say. And the reason is simply that any countable, uh, that any countable order is an increasing 
union of finite suborders. Um, and then you can construct a diagram like that. And in particular, any um, countable ordinal number can be obtained in this way. Um, so this may be some indication that um, there's a lot of um, um, well, computational strength in the statements that we are going to build out of this. Okay, so our goal now will be to ensure that the limit we get by gluing along such a diagram is always well-founded. On an, and on the other hand, we also want to ensure that any countable well order can be obtained as a limit. So we don't want to exclude too much. And we distill um, these um, considerations into the notion of a Goodstein system. So a Goodstein system is a pair of B and C, where B, as before, is one of these functions that tell you which base you should use in the ith step. And um, C is a family of such functions that tell you how to change coefficients below base i into coefficients below base e i plus one. And once again, they have to be strictly um, monotone. Okay, and in order to ensure that the direct limit is well-founded, um, you want to impose two conditions. So, um, well, it's not two different conditions. It's, it's one condition, but it involves sort of two parts. So first you want to consider a function d from n to n such that di is always below bi. And what that means is that um, di will always pick out one of these coefficients below base bi. Or in terms of the picture, um, di will pick out one element of the ith column. So for example, d2 will pick out one of these um, numbers here. And then um, what you also want to do is you want to um, allow yourself to consider an arbitrary infinite subset of the natural numbers. Um, and then what you demand is that for any choice of, of B and Y, um, there will be I and J in Y such that I is smaller than J and DI is smaller equal EJ after applying these coefficient changes. So let's maybe look at the diagram um, again. Um, di will be in some column that comes i that comes before the jth column. And so di will be something here. And then these coefficient changes take you into the jth column. And then in the jth column, you will find dj. And then uh, you will want that dj is at least as big as the value that you get um, uh, for, by changing coefficients starting with di. And so this looks, of course, a lot like well foundedness. Um, some i smaller than j, some previous value um, is smaller equal some larger value. So somehow this, this d doesn't correspond to a strictly descending sequence. Maybe the one thing that's a bit mysterious is um, why you have this y. And the point simply is, um, well, your d, um, it, it will correspond to some infinite sequence in, in, in the limit. And you want to say that this sequence is not strictly descending. Um, but this um, infinite sequence in the limit, it doesn't need to, the, the elements may not come from all the consecutive columns. So um, the first element in your um, sequence in the limit may only come from the fourth column. And then the second element may only come from the 17th column. And you can assume that these numbers increase um, because these columns grow. Um, so if you have done the third element in the fifth column, then you could say, well, it comes from the 18th column because from the fifth, I can go into the 18th and then into the limit. And the Y, um, what it does, it, it just picks out these columns um, that contribute to your infinite sequence in the direct limit. So in other words, this here is just a, um, a way to express that the direct limit is, is well-founded. Really. Any questions here? So it seemed like there, there was a need for an existential quantifier on Y, like uh, you have to pick uh, the set, which is really the relevant values or something like that. But instead here, we have a, uh, you have a universal quantifier on Y, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I get, I'm getting confused. I'm not sure I, I picked your point about the role of Y. Okay. So um, I want to say for any sequence in the limit, it's not infinitely descending. Um, and this sequence in the limit, um, it 
you, you need two objects to determine it. So you need the Y, which tells you which of the columns correspond to the sequence in the limit. And then you need the D to pick the right elements of these columns. So um, really, D and Y together. Yes. Okay, D and Y together really make up this infinite sequence, and you want to say for any infinite sequence, so you say for all D and all Y. That, does that make sense? Yes, yes. We, we, I, I'm now seeing it much more clearly. Yes, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, and now we can look at the first new result. So I wrote a first new result because this is just one instance of a much more general result. And this is, um, in a sense, the, the simplest instance, but still interesting. But I wanted to point out that it's only the simplest instance of this. So um, we can now look at the example that we had before. So here we have uh, Goodstein sequences with respect to binary. Um, uh, binary notation of natural numbers. So that's the example from before, where we had a Goodstein sequence that is not terminating. Um, but if we assume that the base and the coefficient changes form one of these Goodstein sequences, um, then all these Goodstein sequences with respect to uh, binary notation and arbitrary Goodstein sequence will be terminating. And that's precisely what the extended Goodstein theorem for the binary notation says. So it says that for any Goodstein system and any start value, um, the Goodstein sequence um, relative to this data will reach zero. And the um, theorem says that this is equivalent in the context of reverse mathematics to arithmetical comprehension. So arithmetical comprehension um, um, it is equivalent to a statement that the Turing jump relative to any oracle exists. And it's, it's quite an important principle in reverse mathematics. Okay, and um, yeah, what I would, would like to point out is that here really it's about the existence of infinite sets. So arithmetical comprehension, um, it says that the Turing jumps relative to oracles exist. So these um, infinite um, halting sets um, exist. And in statement two, we also need an existential quantifier over infinite sets because it's, it's known um, that over a weak base theory, arithmetical comprehension cannot be equivalent to a purely universal statement. So there would better be an existential quantifier in here. And there is, because in the notion of Goodstein system, there is this universal quantifier over D and Y, which are infinite sets. And um, since the notion of Goodstein system um, appears in the assumption of this extended Goodstein theorem, the universal quantifier in the notion of Goodstein system can then be prenext and becomes an existential quantifier in the extended Goodstein theorem. So we have managed to build in the existence of infinite sets um, in a reasonably natural way because um, it came from this idea of what happens when we change coefficients and um, by looking at these direct limits um, we found precisely the right condition to ensure that the Goodstein theorem is, is still valid. So now I would like to briefly present the, the proof of this theorem. So what is known is that part one, so this principle of arithmetical comprehension is equivalent to a statement about the preservation of uh, well-foundedness, namely to the statement that if X is a well order, then so is two to the X. And two to the X is defined as the set of strictly decreasing sequences in X. Um, with the lexicographic order. So the first entry, x0, the largest one will be dominant, will, will decide the order. And it makes sense to write this 2 to the x because it, it really corresponds to binary notation of natural numbers, right? If you have binary notation, then you can write each number as the, the list of the exponents, and the exponents are strictly decreasing, and also the largest exponent is, is dominant. So that's why this is written 2 to the x. Um, so well, in order to show that one is equivalent to two, it's now, equivalent, it's now enough to show that two is equivalent to three. And that's precisely what I want to do here. So two was for any Goodstein system, um, the resulting Goodstein sequence will reach zero. And three is if X is a well order, then so is two to the X. So let's first um, show that three implies two. So to show two, we consider an arbitrary Goodstein system. 
And then as on, uh, in the example, we glue along this Goodstein system to um, obtain um, a direct limit by, by gluing along the coefficient changes. And since it's a Goodstein sequence, um, this direct limit will be a well order, which I want to call X. Then the next observation is um, that this um, operation that turns uh, an order Y into an order two to the Y is actually a functor or can be extended into a functor. And that's quite straightforward. So if you want to, in order to become a functor, um, this should also act on functions from some X to some Y. And if you have such a function F, then you simply apply it pointwise here. Um, so uh, maybe this is a bit quick, um, but it's, it's not hard to turn this into a function. You mean order preserving functions? Order preserving functions, yes. Yes, absolutely. So we are working over the category of linear order and strictly order preserving functions. Yeah, that, that's important. That's right. And um, what we can do now is that if we have any such Goodstein sequence as, as in two, then we can map this to a sequence in two to the X. Um, and the idea is that, um, well, these sets of coefficients, they can be mapped into X because the sets of coefficients, when we glue them, we obtain X. So we have something like inclusion maps. And since we have a functor now, we can uh, apply this functor to these inclusion maps. And then um, this here will be an element of um, two to the B, where B is the base. And since this, this base is included in X, uh, we can apply the embedding that this functor gives us and go from two to the B to two to the X. And then we get the function uh, we get an embedding of this um, Goodstein sequence into this um, um, direct limit two to the x. And um, what you can show, because all these functions are order preserving, is that um, this um, this image of the Goodstein sequence into to the x must descend until the Goodstein sequence which is zero. Um, so that's because um, let's maybe look at two slides ago slides ago again. So if you look at the step from here to here, then what you do is you increase n0 to ci of n0. But then when you construct a direct limit, you glue along these coefficient changes. And what that means is that n0 and ci of n0 will be identified in the direct limit. So um, even though this is um, uh, can be a huge increase in, in the finite numbers in the direct limits, it's, it's, it doesn't change anything at all. Um, but then um, since you subtract one and take something smaller than this, this will correspond to a step down in the direct limit. So that's why um, these Goodstein sequences, when you map them into two to the X, then they will descend unless the Goodstein sequence reaches zero. But now by three, you know um, that um, two to the X cannot, uh, it is well founded because X was, in well, was a well order and three tells you that two to the X is also a well order. So uh, this cannot happen forever, and that means that the Goodstein sequence must eventually reach zero, which is precisely what you wanted for this generalized Goodstein theorem. So if you have studied the proof of the classical Goodstein theorem, then you will um, see that this is just a, a relativization fit. Any questions about this direction? Okay, so in the other direction, we have this generalized Goodstein theorem, and we want to deduce that if X is a well order, then so is two to the X. So you are given some X, and what you can do is you can now construct a Goodstein system. So a choice of um, bases and coefficient changes, which glue to this given X. And now what you can also do is observe that this functor here, Y to the two to the Y, preserves direct limits. And that what that means intuitively is that um, the elements in here only depend on finitely many elements from Y. Um, so that's clear if you look at the definition of two to the X, um, each element here only depends on finitely many elements from X. And you can express that by saying that this functor preserves direct limits. And this has the effect that any um, 
descending sequence in 2 to the x um, is majorized by the image of some Goodstein sequence. So, um, well, all these elements in 2 to the x, they only depend on finitely many elements from x. So they will all come from some column if you go far enough. And then you can look at values of, of your Goodstein sequences in that column and map that to something that dominates the given, the, the given sequence in, in the direct limit in 2 to the x. Um, and here I wrote possibly for modified B. So um, what, that, what that means is that the, the B, it gives you the base in the ith step. But it may be that this descending sequence um, in the direct limit that it sort of uh, jumps some of the columns so that it doesn't use um, all the columns again. And at this place, um, you have to counteract that by changing the B. Namely, what you want to do is you want to speed up the base change. So if, if the sequence um, skips some of the columns, then the base should change faster as well so that it also sort of jumps these, these columns. Um, so maybe the details are um, a bit uh, hard to explain. In, in the talk, they are in the paper, of course. Um, but really, the, 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 the point is that any descending sequence in 2 to the x is majorized by the image of one of these Goodstein sequences. But now, if we have the extended Goodstein theorem, then we will know that um, this majorizing Goodstein sequence must reach 0. And it turns out that the natural number 0 also corresponds to the minimal element in this direct limit, 2 to the x. So um, your sequence is majorized by something that reaches the minimal element, which means that your sequence must also reach the minimal element. And once it has reached the, the minimal element, it cannot descend any further. So that way you can show that there are no infinitely descending sequences and that 2 to the x is a well order um, as needed to apply this known result from reverse mathematics. Um, this one equivalence between preservation of well-foundedness and arithmetical comprehension to see that arithmetical comprehension is also equivalent to this extended Goodstein theorem. So if there are questions, just, just interrupt. What I want to do now is I want to present a more general framework. Um, so I said that this is only the simplest instance of, of a more general theorem that we have. And um, I, I think by looking at this proof sketch that I gave, um, we, we can already see that this, this can really be generalized. So there didn't, uh, the, um, no specific properties of binary notation were used. So, okay, to express this, I want to write LO for the category of linear orders and um, strictly order preserving functions. And I want to write um, NAT for natural numbers for the full subcategory with these objects. Um, so what that means is that um, NAT, it corresponds of the finite linear orders. And more precisely, for each finite linear order, I choose a um, canonical representative, um, namely the numbers from 0 to n minus 1, ordered as usual. And I will denote this order by n. And now. Um, the notion that you need to generalize this is um, based on Girard's notion of dilator, and I want to call it Goodstein dilator. So a Goodstein dilator is a functor from natural numbers seen as finite orders into arbitrary linear orders, such that the following holds. So if you have a natural number B, an object here, then the linear order D of B should be an initial segment of N. And intuitively, you should think of um, D of B as those numbers which have a base B representation. So in the case of binary representation, D of B would be all the numbers below 2 to the B. In the case of hereditary exponential notation, um, D of B would be um, all natural numbers, because every number has a, a hereditary base 2 representation, for example. So um, this initial segment can be proper or not. Then this functor D um, needs to preserve pullbacks. So what that means um, intuitively is that D really corresponds to um, notations, to normal form notations for numbers. 
And more precisely, um, preservation of pullbacks has the following effect. Um, any element of D of B will depend on coefficients from some minimal subset of um, the coefficients below this space. So, um, well, if you have some subset of this set here, then this would correspond to a morphism um, between the corresponding finite orders, and then your number could be in the range of that morphism or not. And if it is in the range of that morphism, then you would say that the number only depends on the coefficients that you started with. And in principle, there could be several different sets of coefficients that one number depends on if you adopt this um, abstract viewpoint. But if D preserves pullbacks, then there is one unique minimal set of coefficients that each of these uh, numbers below D of B depends on. So preservation of pullback just means uh, unique normal forms for natural numbers. And then the third condition um, is a bit ad hoc. It's just a technical condition that we need. What it means um, intuitively is that um, the number zero has a base zero representation. And this, in, in other words, it has a representation without coefficients. And this representation of zero is independent of the base. So if you have um, any function, well, there's just one function, the empty function, from the empty set of coefficients into any set of coefficients, um, then if you apply d of e to um, zero, you will still get zero. So zero has a representation without coefficients, and this is independent of the base. That's what this third condition said. And that's ensured, uh, that, that's needed to ensure that the good scene sequence, once it reaches zero, stays at zero. And now you can define um, a good scene sequence relative to such a d. Um, so D is a Goodstein dilator, and, and once again, you should think of it as a relativized, uh, as, as an arbitrary normal form notation system for natural numbers. Um, and these Goodstein systems are defined as follows. So once again, you have um, a given start value M, which should be, which should have a base B0 normal form. So it should be in D of B0. And then the ith value, um, of the Goodstein sequence will then in general also be in uh, D of B of I. So it will have a base B I representation. And then um, to get the next entry of the um, uh, generalized Goodstein sequence, you consider this C I, this um, function which prescribes how the coefficients are changed. And C I is um, a function from base bi identified with a set of its predecessors, so of the relevant coefficients, into bi plus 1. So that means that um, um, then this d of ci, since d is a functor, it goes from the numbers that have a base bi representation into the numbers that have a base bi plus 1 representation. So you get from here, from your previous value to the next value in uh, D of E i plus 1. Sorry, it's not very readable. Um, and then you subtract 1, as before. And you can subtract 1 um, because you are in initial segments of the natural numbers. So this is just the usual operation minus 1 on the natural numbers. OK. So, um, yeah, it's quite some machinery, um, but really it's just um, a reasonable way to write down Goodstein sequences for general notations for natural numbers and arbitrary changes of coefficients. And now that uh, the general result that we get from this general framework is as follows. So, um, first, one, one important thing um, to say is that if you have any such Goodstein dilator. So this Goodstein dilator, it will take finite orders as input and give linear orders as output. And you can extend it into a functor um, d bar, which takes arbitrary linear orders as input and still takes linear orders as output. And you can um, define this extension by taking direct limits. So the idea is that any linear order is the direct limit of finite orders. In other words, it's defined by gluing finite orders um, or still more concretely, it's the union of its finite suborders. Um, and if you sort of take an arbitrary linear order, 
decompose it into its finite suborders, um, apply D, and then glue again in the category of linear orders, then you will get um, a linear order as the value of your extended function. So that's something that, that, that already comes from, from Girard's theory of delators. And the general result that we have is that still over this base theory of reverse mathematics, the following are equivalent for an arbitrary Goodstein delator D. So that the quantification does happen in this meta theory. And the two equivalent statements are first of all, the extended Goodstein theorem, but now for D. And the extended Goodstein theorem, as before, says that if you have any Goodstein system, so anything that, that clues to a well order, and any start value that can be written in base B0, then the resulting Goodstein sequence defined relative to this superscript D um, will eventually reach zero uh, for some I. So that's, um, you could also say, um, but in this case, Goodstein sequence is relative to D terminate with arbitrary coefficient changes. And this is equivalent now to a generalized statement of, of what we had before. So today, we, to, before we had the statement, if X is a well order, then so is two to the X. And here we have the statement, if X is a well order, then um, if you apply uh, the extension of your Goodstein delator to X, you still get a well order. In other words, this extension preserves well orders, and that makes it um, a delator in the sense of, uh, in the sense of Giva. And now if you specialize um, this D to a binary notation for numbers, then you really get back the theorem that we had before. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. Um, in the second part, I want to show a more interesting example. So we have the general theorem for general D. We have seen one instance for binary notation, and I want to give an example that's um, a bit more complicated than, than binary notation. So as I said just before um, our break, we have this uh, general result here now about uh, Goodstein's theorem for arbitrary notation systems represented by what I call uh, Goodstein delators. Uh, sorry, this D is a Goodstein delator. And then I want to give an example that is stronger than the one that we had before where we were looking at binary notation for natural numbers. So, um, the one with binary notation um, came from or did rely on a previous result about um, preservation of well-foundedness for this transformation of x into 2 to the x. Um, or in other words, into um, uh, for, on the uh, operation of uh, exponentiation from ordinal arithmetic. And then I want to look at a stronger um, operation from ordinal arithmetic, and then um, we'll see how from this we can um, find stronger version of this extended Goodstein theorem. Namely, uh, the stronger operation of ordinal arithmetic that I want to look at is the Weblon hierarchy. Um, the Weblon hierarchy is a hierarchy of functions from ordinals to ordinals indexed by ordinals, and it's defined recursively. So um, um, for zero, the zeroth function in this hierarchy is commonly defined as ordinal exponentiation to the base omega. I uh, will say why that is relevant a bit um, further down. And then if alpha is not zero, um, then phi of alpha is um, defined as the enumerating function of the joint fixed points of all the previous functions. So these are all normal functions on the ordinals, which means they are strictly increasing and continuous at uh, limit ordinals. And since they are continuous at, no, uh, at limit ordinals, they do have fixed points. In fact, they have class many fixed points. And then I can enumerate them and define phi alpha of gamma as the gamma joint fixed point of all the previous functions in the hierarchy. And now the crucial property um, in, in our context is this characterization of, uh, in, of uh, inequalities between um, ordinals in that hierarchy. Namely, phi alpha of gamma is smaller than phi beta of uh, delta, precisely if one of these cases um, applies. And maybe to make this a bit less mystical, let, let's look at the last case. So alpha bigger than beta. If alpha is bigger than beta, then all the values of phi alpha 
will be fixed points of phi beta, um, just because phi alpha was defined as the enumeration of fixed points of, of the previous functions. So in particular, this here will be equal to phi beta of phi alpha of gamma, because this is a fixed point of phi beta. And then this inequality here, um, um, since also these functions are strictly increasing, um, is equivalent to inequality between the arguments. So this holds precisely if alpha of gamma is below delta, which is exactly this uh, condition here. So um, that, that's where this comes from. And uh, what we can now do is we can represent these values phi alpha gamma by systems of term notations. And then these systems of term notations, um, you can look at them not only when alpha and gamma are um, ordinal numbers, but in fact when x and y are arbitrary linear orders. Um, so the idea is that in, in, in the system of term notations, you will have uh, terms that are of this form here, where alpha is an element of x, and gamma uh, will be a term that you have previously constructed. Um, but these here, they are, they are not all the ordinals. Um, so for example, um, all these ordinals uh, of this form here, um, the values of phi of zero, they are additively closed. Um, and in particular, the, um, the even stronger fixed points will also be additively closed. So um, the ordinals of this form are only the additively closed ones. And then in order to get uh, all the ordinals in the initial segment that you're looking at into your term notation system, you will also have to um, look at uh, sums of the form phi alpha zero of S zero plus etc. plus phi of alpha k, let's say of s k, and where the alpha i are now elements of this x, and the s k are terms that you have previously constructed, and they have to be formed um, with, um, uh, with, with certain restrictions. Um, and then you can also define the order between the ordinals um, on these terms, namely on sums, uh, you can just sort of take the order from, from Cantor's normal form theorem, um, and on terms of this form here, you take um, this equivalence here as a recursive definition of the order. So that's really a recursive definition because um, when you decide this, for example, according to the third clause, you have to compare the left um, term with the argument of the right term. Um, but since this argument delta is less complex than this whole term phi of beta and delta, the joint complexity of these two terms uh, drops, and then you have a recursive characterization of the ordering. Okay, so um, these are the uh, notions of ordinal arithmetic and the associated terms that we will want to look at um, in the following. Okay, now let's look at the known result about um, these operations that I promised. So once again, we have an equivalence over RCA0. Um, so in this usual base theory of reverse, mathematic, reverse mathematics. And now um, the first statement of G equivalence is arithmetical transfinite recursion, um, which is much, much stronger than this principle of arithmetical comprehension that we had previously. So um, yeah, maybe one way to see this is that um, arithmetical comprehension from before um, corresponds to piano arithmetic, which has this ordinal epsilon zero. Um, as proof theoretic ordinal, and epsilon zero is precisely the um, first fixed point of um, this function phi um, zero, so it's uh, equal to phi one of zero, first fixed point of the previous function phi zero. And of course, the terms that you get here, um, the ordinals that you get here become much, 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 much larger. And um, if you take um, sort of the ordinal that is approximated by, um, by iterating this, this Webland construction, then you get the proof theoretic ordinal of this statement here. So it's much stronger than the statement that we had before. And um, this principle is known to be equivalent to also to a statement about the preservation of well-foundedness, namely the statement that if x is a well order, then so is um, phi x of zero. So the first fixed point of the x function in the Webland hierarchy is well-founded. 
Uh, I think um, that's first due to Harvey Friedman. And then there is a computability theoretic proof by Professor Marcone together with uh, Antonio Montalban. And there's also a proof theoretic proof by um, uh, Vatian and Weiermann. Okay, so we have this result, which is um, somewhat parallel to the one that we used before. And what we would like is we would like to um, transform um, this into a stronger Goodstein principle, which would then also be equivalent to arithmetic or transfinite recursion. However, there's one obstruction. Uh, okay, that's what I wrote on the last slide now. I actually already had it here. Um, namely, um, already this um, relatively small um, value in the Wappen hierarchy has order type far beyond the order type of the natural numbers, which is uh, small omega. So this operation here, which transforms an order x into this order phi x of zero, um, it even if you put finite orders here, even if you put natural numbers here, the output will be something highly transfinite. Um, and what that means is that this operation here, it's not induced um, by a normal form for natural numbers. So it's not the continuation by direct limits of a normal form for natural numbers. Um, it's not a Goodstein delator, and that means that we do not obtain an equivalent Goodstein theorem, um, at least not directly. Now, to save um, the situation, um, we could have the idea that may maybe you can slow down this function a bit. So slow down this function, which maps alpha to the first fixed point um, of the functions in the Weblin hierarchy for alpha. And by slow down, I mean that um, it should preserve um, it should act on natural numbers. It should preserve finite um, uh, finite orders. So this operation here, when x is finite, this should also be finite or at most uh, isomorphic to the um, structure of natural numbers. And but then on infinite values, it should somehow catch up, um, so that uh, still the strength of this principle here is is preserved. And um, the hope that this might be possible comes from the fact that it's possible for ordinal exponentiation. So if you look at the transformation of alpha into omega to the alpha, then this also does not preserve um, finite orders. And it does not, um, it is not induced by a normal form for natural numbers. However, um, two to the alpha is equal to two to the omega times alpha. Um, and for that reason, we can replace um, ordinal exponentiation with base omega by ordinal exponentiation with base two. This has the advantage that now this here, it's obviously an operation on natural numbers, but also, um, well, this uh, multiplication is relatively innocent from the viewpoint of uh, reverse mathematics and computability theory. It preserves well-foundedness, um, and up to this operation um, that's relatively innocent, um, base omega and base two um, coincide, so we can just as well use base two, which then comes from a normal form of natural numbers. And the idea now is to do the same um, with uh, the Babylon function. Okay, to, so to see how um, that, that works, I want to uh, bring uh, Ackermann into play, namely the Ackermann function. And I want to um, work with one specific variant of the Ackermann function, which is uh, technically particularly um, useful. Um, so for that, I want to recall the so-called Rigorschic hierarchy or hierarchy of fast-growing functions indexed by natural numbers here. So the first function in that hierarchy is simply the successor function, f0 of n is n plus 1. And then I define these functions f, um, b, um, b stands for base, once again, uh, I define them by um, a recursion on b. So if I want the value of the b plus first function on n, then what I do is I take argument n and I iterate the previous function f b uh, one plus n times. And then if you um, sort of diagonalize over this process, um, so um, you now consider this b as argument and um, map it to the lower index to f b of one, um, then this function here grows faster than all primitive recursive functions, and it's it's some sort of variant of the Ackermann function. And what we will see is this, that this um, version here of the Ackermann function, it induces a normal form for natural numbers. And by generalizing that to infinite ordinals, we will get back something very close to the Laplan hierarchy. 
Um, so in other words, uh, the Weblung hierarchy is something like the uh, continuation of the Ackermann function by direct limits. Um, and that's also something that um, th that's new, I think. And, and I think that in itself is, is a nice result uh, because Ackermann function and Weblung hierarchy are quite well-known concepts in mathematical logic. Um, but as far as I know, um, I, I didn't know of any connections before. So to see that they are actually quite intimately connected is, is interesting, I think. Okay, so this crucial notion of, of normal form that comes from the Ackermann function, uh, these normal functions, uh, these normal forms have uh, already been investigated by uh, Arai. And um, this normal form theorem says that uh, every positive natural number, so different from zero, um, can be written like this um, as an expression that involves these functions fb from the fast growing hierarchy with the property that these um, indices here um, are strictly increasing. So b1 is the largest index and with the property that the um, exponent in the n plus first step is smaller than the value that you have before. So for example, this nk is smaller than the value um, that you have here if you leave this last um, function away. Um, and that, that, that works as follows. So if you want to construct the normal form of a given number, then what you do is you first choose um, bi as large as possible. So you choose the maximum lower index such that f of b1 of one um, is not bigger than the number that you want to represent in normal form. And then you choose the maximal number of iterations that is possible so that you don't become bigger than, than the number that you want to represent. Um, and then you have something that's less than or equal this number. If it's equal, then you are done. If it's smaller, then you do the same thing again. You choose B2 as large as possible. And this choosing first B1 as large as possible has the effect that uh, this here holds. And um, what's also important to know is that now if you have two such normal forms and you want to compare their numerical values, then um, it suffices to look at the lists um, of lower and upper indices, and the one that is bigger in the lexicographic order um, will um, correspond to the normal form with the bigger numerical value. So to be more precise, when you compare these lists, um, the um, number that matters most is this first lower index B1, and then um, the second thing you compare is this upper index N1, and when they coincide, then you continue with B2, and um, so on. Okay, so this is uh, are these Ackermann normal forms. And now these Ackermann normal forms, um, they allow us to turn um, the Ackermann function into a Goodstein dilator, which I then call Ackermannian Goodstein dilator. Um, so it should be a functor from natural numbers to um, ordinals. Um, yes. And um, on objects, it's really just the Ackermann function. So on the last slide, I said that I, want, I, said that I wanted to take um, the map from B to F B of one as my version of the Ackermann function. And if I identify um, this number here with the set of its predecessors, then I get precisely this um, A of B. And uh, well, once again, um, if A is to become a good stimulator, then A of B um, should um, correspond to the numbers that have a base B normal form. Um, and, and that's the case here. So they will have one of these Ackermann normal forms where, where the BIs are smaller than, than my base B. So they can be seen as coefficients. And now if uh, this is to become a functor, then I also have to say how it acts on morphisms. So the F here would be a function that goes from some b into some b prime and all these b um, k they are coefficients so they will be smaller than the base b and in order to apply um in order to define the action of the ackermann dilator on f i consider the value of this function here on one of these normal forms and i dis uh, i define it as follows so on um, the lower indices, I simply apply my function f. So this will be increase the, the coefficients here. The lower indices are the coefficients. Okay. And then in the upper indices, I recursively apply 
then this function that I'm defining at the moment is function a of f. And um, so on the previous slide, we had the condition that this, uh, for example, n of k is smaller than um, th the rest of the expression. And in particular, it's smaller than the entire expression. So this is really a recursion over um, natural numbers, a course of values recursion. And uh, the fact that I um, that I apply a of f rather than f here already indicates that we already have something like an hereditary normal form. So not hereditarily exponential, hereditarily Ackermannian might be a better expression. And it turns out that these uh, values here are still in normal form and that a of f is then order preserving. And um, this induces an, um, a Goodstein sequence with respect to these Ackermann normal forms. So this here was the general definition. And maybe um, it's good to see how the definition works concretely. So the Goodstein sequence starts once again with this um, starting value m. And then um, when I have the ith value of my Goodstein sequence in order to get the next one, what I'll do, I'll take the ith value, write it in this Ackermann normal form, then use my coefficient change, apply a to it, and then apply this operation to, to the ith value in normal form. So I will um, change these lower indices by this coefficient change ci, and I will change the upper indices hereditarily, um, and then I will get some uh, generally larger number, and when I subtract one from it, I get the next um, entry in my Goodstein sequence. And now the question becomes, um, how strong is the Goodstein theorem? Um, relative to this Ackermann delator. There are questions here. I, I assume that in that case you are also proving that the, uh, in the definition of your AF on the right hand side, we have something which is still a correct uh, term, let's say, for this Ackermannian representation. Uh, you mean these here? Yes, so that the exponents are respect to the conditions, I mean, the, the one plus AF of NK should be smaller than the number that, that comes later, let's say, right? Yes, that, that's absolutely so, right. So in you principle- need to, You need to do, to do rec recursion and induction sort of in, in a parallel fashion, sort of. That, that's right. And um, so, in, in fact, you, you also need to do two inductions simultaneously. Namely, you have to show simultaneously that this here is in normal form and that the function that you define is order preserving. And if you know by induction hypothesis that the previous values are in normal form, then you can use this theorem here to compare the values according to lexicographic order. And then you can use that to show that the values are still in normal form. So I don't hear further questions, so I will proceed. Um, okay, so now A is this Ackermannian Goodstein delator. In other words, it's just the Ackermann function, which also acts on morphisms. So it's the Ackermann function seen as a functor. And now what we have to do is um, we know that every um, Goodstein delator, every delator on, on natural numbers can be extended into one that acts on arbitrary linear orders, or in particular, that acts on ordinals. I can call this the extension into the transfinite. And you have to figure out what this, what this extension of the Ackermann delator is concretely so that you can work with it. And there are two alternative approaches. So one is, let's say, more semantical. Um, you look at the definition of the fast-growing hierarchy, and you simply look at the transfinite analogs and, and hope that, um, that um, this gives you your extension. And in fact, it does. So previously, we had um, these functions in the fast growing hierarchy FB from natural numbers to natural numbers, um, where B was a natural number. And now we want to look at functions F alpha from ordinals to ordinals, where alpha is now an ordinal. And in fact, they will extend these, so I also call them F. 
And the first two clauses are uh, just the same. So um, F0 is still the successor function and at uh, successor indices you iterate. And there is one small um, uh, difference. I don't know if it's small, but there's one difference. Namely, these iterations here, they are also transfinite now, and in particular, you have to consider limit iterations. So you have to define them, and you do that in the obvious way. So at successor iterations, you just apply the function one more time, and at limits, you take the supremum of all the previous iterations. And then you have to look at the limit case of this extended fast-growing hierarchy now. And uh, here you also do the, um, in, in this context, obvious um, continuation um, by continuity. So you say that if lambda is a limit, then f lambda of gamma is the supremum of f alpha of gamma overall, the alpha below lambda. And then you can show that um, where previously a of b was defined as all the numbers below fb of 1. So this is oh, isomorphic, let's say, to fb of 1. Um, and here, the same holds in the transfinite. So the um, extension of the a by direct limits is really isomorphic to f alpha of 1 uh, defined in this way. And the second um, explanation, which is maybe a bit less intuitive, but uh, technically more important in our context is a more syntactical approach. Namely, you want to view this uh, transfinite extension of um, A as a, a system of term notations. And what you do is, well, you first you put in a constant symbol zero, and then um, you do an inductive definition where you close the system of term notations as follows. Namely, if you have terms S1 to SK, which you already have constructed, um, then you add terms of this form here, where the lower indices come from your argument linear order x, and the upper indices are the terms that you have constructed previously, and you still need this condition that the term, um, for example, this term SK is smaller than the rest of the expression. So in particular, I would like to point out, uh, so these here are inequalities in, in x, um, X is a linear order. That's nothing to worry about here. But here, this is an inequality in the term system A bar of X. So you need to define the set of terms and the order on the set of terms simultaneously. But if you use the right measure of complexity, then um, you, you can do it. And but this also corresponds on the previous slide, we saw that um, this A of F on the lower indices, you just apply your function, but on the upper indices, you apply um, A of F hereditarily. And this also corresponds to the fact that the lower indices are just the elements um, of your given order, but in the upper um, indices, you use the terms that you have already constructed. So there's also some hereditary process uh, going on. And well, as I said, you need to define the order simultaneously. And once again, you can use this uh, lexicographic order from the Ackermann normal form theorem that we saw before. Okay, and now comes the crucial theorem. So um, this is the main technical, well, we have this general framework, um, but then the second sort of main um, technical result is, is, is this one. Um, namely, if you have any linear order x, then the extension of the Ackermann function by direct limits on x can be embedded into this value of the Veblen hierarchy. So into the first fixed point of this, um, uh, the, the functions below one plus x. And then this can be again embedded into um, a value of the extension of the Ackermann function, namely you take the product order of um, the natural numbers and um, you are given order x together with uh, two new minimal elements. So you have an element zero, you have an element one, and then all the elements of x um, here will be bigger. And these embeddings here tell you that, um, um, well, the extension of the Ackermann dilator and the Weblen functions are um, very closely related. In particular, if um, x equals alpha is um, an epsilon number, 
so it's close on the um, ordinal exponentiation, then the extension of the Ackermann dilator will yield um, an order that is isomorphic to uh, this value of the Weblen hierarchy. So then they really coincide at these epsilon numbers. And using that theorem, we can derive um, the promised result about uh, generalized Goodstein processes. So here we work once again in reverse mathematics and we make the base theory a bit stronger. This is just because uh, RCA0 is, is not strong enough to, to handle the Ackermann function. So um, this, this induction that we add here is, is simply that we can um, work with the Ackermann function in our meta theory without varying. Um, otherwise, we don't need it. Uh, and this is an equivalence now between the stronger principle of transfinite, of arithmetical transfinite recursion, um, then the statement that if x is a well order, then so is um, the value of the uh, Ackermann function extended into the transfinite on x. And then the third part is the extended Goodstein theorem, once again, in this case for the Ackermann dilator. So um, you have an arbitrary Goodstein system. In other words, you can change the base and the coefficients um, in some restricted way. Uh, and any Goodstein sequence that is defined relative to these Ackermann normal forms will terminate. The proof is as follows. So um, our general result tells us that two and three are equivalent. So for any dilator, the extended Goodstein theorem for this dilator and the claim that its extension preserves well orders is equivalent. That's what we saw before. And um, so it remains to show that one is equivalent to two. But we already know um, by this result um, of Friedman and Tratien Weiermann and Marco de Montalban that one is equivalent to the statement that uh, the Weblen hierarchy preserves well foundedness. And by these embeddings, um, we can replace the Weblen hierarchy by this extension of the Ackermann function. So, um, so what is the use of sigma 2 induction needed here in the proof? I mean, uh... In, in showing in RCA not that uh, that actually those embeddings that you have in the first theorem uh, actually hold is, is there where you're using the sigma two induction? Um, no, here we actually don't need it. Um, the point where we need it is simply when we look want to look at these objects and we want to know that they exist then we need to know that these values of the Ackermann function exist. Okay. And um, another place where you, where you may want to use it is in defining these, um, these um, Goodstein sequences with respect to the Ackermann function. Because, um, so you have the ith entry of your Goodstein sequence, you write it in Ackermann normal form that you can do. But then once you, um, once you have increased the base and the coefficients, you have some expression in the fast growing hierarchy and you want to evaluate it to a natural number to get um, the next element of your Goodstein sequence. And this evaluating to a natural number, for this you need to know that the functions in the fast growing hierarchy and in particular the Ackermann function are, are total. Okay. What you could do is you could at this point work with uh, term representations of natural numbers rather than actual natural numbers. And then it may be possible to, to avoid um, a sigma two induction. But we thought okay. that it's, it's simply much nicer to say that the good sure. sequences are sequences of actual numbers rather than sequences of some terms. I see. On the other hand, um, here you don't need it because you can view this um, A bar of X as a term system. So in this theorem, things really are term systems rather than values of terms and, and there you don't need the induction. Okay. So do you know do you know that this sigma two induction is really needed to show convergence of the, the, the Sackerman function, or it's just that it seems so? I mean, it's, uh, mm -hmm. if you have sigma two induction, you can carry out whatever the argument is needed. Uh, um, it's simply that we we used it. To, to make sure that our definitions work. We don't know whether it's the, the minimal requirement 
and we, we couldn't prove an equivalence because well we already put it in the definitions not just in the in the statement um, I see. I see. yeah so um, I, I don't have a better answer I think all right thanks Please go ahead for me. Okay. So, um, don't have that much longer. Um, I have conclusions, and I wanted to show you briefly how these two embeddings um, work and what the main points are. But it's just one slide. So, first, we want an embedding of this extension of the Ackermann function into the Weblon hierarchy. And the point that I want to make is that this is the easy direction. Namely, um, in this extension of the uh, Ackermann function, you have terms of this form. Um, so they look like expressions in the um, uh, fast growing hierarchy, but with transfinite parameters. And if you have an expression like this, where you have at least one of the Fs, that, that's the most interesting case, then what you do is you call the shorter expression without the outermost function, uh, you, you could call it T. And then the value of f on that expression is recursively defined as follows. So you take the function phi in the Weblon hierarchy, which is uh, determined by this largest uh, index, uh, the, the smallest index, sorry, of the outermost expression. Take this function from the Weblon hierarchy. And then as its argument, you take the sum of f of t, where t is this remaining term and f on this um, outermost exponent um, and that works um, okay and maybe um, to explain why it's the easy direction it's better to look at the hard direction because um, well here the definition is, is much less straightforward so in the hard direction we need a function from um, the weblon hierarchy into a value into um, the extension of the Ackermann function. And this should produce values in normal form, um, simply because otherwise it will be very hard to prove things um, like um, the fact that it's order preserving. And well, actually, if, um, if we view this as a term system um, rather than an ordinal that's defined semantically, then it will consist of normal forms. So then we really need to make sure that the values are normal forms. And in particular, um, the so, so in here we have normal forms of, uh, like this. And in particular, the uh, lower indices must be strictly increasing. And this need not be true for expressions um, in the Weblon hierarchy. So in the Weblon hierarchy, you can also restrict to certain normal forms, but even there it can happen that you have an index zero and then another index zero and then uh, and then maybe a larger index one. So um, you could not simply say, okay, I take this outermost index zero as the first lower index um, of my fast growing functions f and then continue recursively because then the next index would also be zero and these indices wouldn't uh, wouldn't increase. So what you do instead is um, that if you are given a term, let's say this term here, then you inspect this term and you always look at the most relevant subterm. So if you have um, a value of, um, of one of these five functions, then there is only one subterm and the argument, so you take that one. But for example, if you have a sum, then you have two subterms, the left sum and the right sum, and then um, you will say, under certain conditions, the left sum is more important, and under other conditions, the remaining sum may be more important. And then you inspect your term, and you go to the um, uh, the most. Uh, you always go to the most important subterm um, until you hit a term with a larger lower index. So in this case here, you would have to do two, you, you would have to do three steps. So from S, you go to this subterm, then you go to the sum, and then you go to the left index, and here you have hit something with lower index. And this um, subterm with lower index, so T of S will always be the most important immediate subterm. So uh, this argument here, 
and t star of x will be um, the um, uh, the uh, subterm that you hit eventually with larger index. Um, so this, in this case, um, t star of s is phi one of zero, which is here phi one of zero. And once you have found that, you can apply g recursively. So g is the embedding that you want to construct. And it's more complicated than before, um, simply because the fact that you don't have an immediate recursion over terms, but you have to inspect these terms, um, and you don't really know how far you have to go. That just makes it technically difficult. And also, there are then a few more things that you have to ensure. So, first of all, um, recall that these expressions here, they are compared lexicographically, where the innermost um, lower and upper indices are um, the most important things to determine the order. So, um, if you want G to be order preserving, then you have to make sure that this um, subterm that you hit eventually, that this sort of determines the order of the entire term, or at least it, it, it's dominant. Um, so if, if this subterm is smaller than the subterm that comes from a different term, then you need to have the same order between the terms. And this works because the functions in the weapon hierarchy, they are always fixed points of the previous functions. So um, if you hit this uh, subterm with a larger index, um, by applying smaller indices outside of it, you can never reach above the next subterm. So, and, and in this sense, this um, subterm with, with a larger index dominates the monotonicity properties of this term S itself. Okay, so that's kind of fine. Um, but then you need to um, ensure a few other things. So, um, one of the things you need to do is you have to count how often you have hit the lower indice index that you started with before you hit a larger lower index. Um, because in a sense, that these lower indices that you started with, uh, they also generate fixed points, but of a lower order. Um, and this also dominates the monotonicity properties of the term. So if you generate, let's say, five fixed points of these lower order above your large fixed point, then you are higher up than if you only generated three of these fixed points. And this, uh, uh, so um, H of S will always give you the um, lower index of your term, and H star of S, just as T star of S, gives you um, the, the number of times that you have hit the outermost index before you have found um, this inner dominating term. So in this case here, in the case of S, you hit the outer index zero two times. And then uh, for technical reasons, you want to add one. So if you have one plus two, then you get this uh, three here. And the one um, is uh, one plus the index of the term that you add. So index zero uh, leads to one. Okay, so then you have this thing here, which kind of tells you something about the monotonicity by recording how often you hit uh, fixed points of certain levels. And then the next thing you want to do is, um, if, if, if this still agrees for two terms, then the comparison between these terms depends on the size of the um, largest immediate subterm. So then uh, T of S is the, uh, the most relevant immediate subterm of S, and you apply G to it recursively, and then sort of that's the next thing that determines the order between your terms. And if all this stuff agrees, then you want to look at R of S, and R of S is the remaining subterms. So in the case of one of these phi expressions, R of S is just zero. That's why we just have one plus, uh, well, for technical reasons, you put this to be one. So we have upper index two here. But for example, if you would have a sum, then it wouldn't be enough to compare the most relevant subterms, but you would then also have to look at the remainder and apply G recursively to it. And this would then be the final comparison that determines the order between terms. Um, and yeah, this was difficult simply because you have to inspect terms and you don't really know how for how long and it's notationally heavy, um, but also it's interesting and hard to get the right intuitions about how exactly these these phi terms work and how that translate into these uh, Ackermann notation systems that um, really work quite differently on first sight. Okay. So these are 
the two directions that we need for our embeddings and from which we can conclude our equivalence between arithmetical transfer and re recursion and the extended Goodstein theorem for the Ackermann delator. So to conclude, um, let me just um, re repeat what, what I view as, as the message and why I personally find this interesting. So what we have seen is that Goodstein's original theorem is, is now part of a large uniform picture. And this large picture combines um, finite combinatorics, so the version of Goodstein's theorem from Kirby's, uh, Kirby and Paris, um, with variants um, that have to do with the existence of complex infinite sets, uh, these complex countable sets. Um, so it ranges from the finite to the infinite, and also um, sort of orthogonal to that, it covers statements of various consistency strengths. And all this is part of a picture that becomes uniform due to this notion of Ackermann delator and the uh, of Goodstein delator and the general construction of Goodstein sequences. And then the second thing that's something that just uh, surprised me and that I found really nice is that the Babylon hierarchy is is closely related to um, this extension of the Ackermann function by direct limits. I would like to stress once again that this is not just some formal extension of the Ackermann function that we came up with by uh, sort of taking the defining clauses and, and generalizing them, but it's really the extension that we get automatically if we apply direct limits. And I think it's surprising because Webblum hierarchy and Ackermann function are, are sort of household names that are well known in logic, and I, I like the connection between them. If you want to see details, um, they are on the archive. Of course, you can just uh, Google for our names and, and you will also find this. Thank you very much.